We have all been bombarded with messages that tell us that bigger is better. But is a bigger business the only way to be a successful business owner? For those of you who are new here, I'm Lydia Lee, and I'm a work reinvention coach and small business strategist. And my job is to help you to build a meaningful business that you'll love, designed from your strengths, values, and personality. In today's video episode, I invited my friend Ashley Gartland, who is the host of the Better Than Big podcast, to really challenge this misconception that in order for us to earn more, we have to go big. And as a mother of two energetic daughters and a desire to create space in her schedule for things like trail runs and family adventures, Ashley learned how to do less and grow more to be able to run a six-figure coaching business by working only 25 hours a week. So naturally, I had a lot of questions. How do we grow our businesses by getting better, not bigger? What are the essential questions we should be asking ourselves to build the ideal business model and an approach to how we really want to work. So if you want to build a business intentionally so that you can design it to serve the life you really want to have, I know that you're going to get a whole lot out of this conversation with Ashley. Here we go. All right. A big warm welcome to Ashley Gartland, who is our guest today for the show. Thank you so much for coming on this conversation with me today, Ashley. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I am a huge fan of what I call tiny but mighty businesses. <laughs> and, you know, when I started Screw the Cubicle almost seven years ago, it wasn't sort of something I thought about very much. I just thought about escaping corporate and doing something independent. Uh, but I never thought that much in the beginning of time about aligning the decisions I make in my business with the kind of life I want to have. And I kind of found that you know, through making lots of mistakes and trying on too many things for size, you know, in the beginning of time to finally realize that there is, you know, a something that's meant for me, something that isn't what other people are peddling out there. That is my jam and being a lot more mindful, you know, about the decisions that I'm making in my business. And kind of this is why I've been really excited to invite you on the show. We've had several conversations by email and Loom videos, and I've been, been a big fan of yours for, for many, many years. Um, and I think, you know, the people that's listening to the show who are new business owners, they're budding business owners, some of them have started a business and things have gotten already out of hand. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're moms, they're, they have, they have full-time jobs while they're doing this. Um, so, you know, what we're going to talk about today, I think is going to be really beneficial for people to be very conscious about how they're designing their business. And I love this concept we're going to talk more about today about building a better business rather than a bigger business, because as you and I know, that's the message out there, right? In the online digital marketing world is bigger is better, more, 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 right? And I think this will be a very grounding conversation for people that may have had an inclination that something didn't sit right with me <laughs> with that message. Um, but I really want to start the conversation asking you a question because here at Screw the Cubicle, we're all about reinventions. You know, when is the time for reinvention? When do we courageously say yes to a reinvention? Um, so I want to ask you, what was the one moment in your life that may have instigated an opportunity for you to reinvent yourself, whether it's the way you wanted to live or work? Like, what was that moment for you that, you, that, that was a, a great idea for reinvention? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's probably been so many, right? But the, the biggest one, I think, is when I decided to pivot from one business to the next. You know, I graduated from college, started my business pretty much straight out of the gate. I had a bunch of other, you know, random side jobs, side hustles that I was doing while the business grew. But I ran a freelance writing business for about eight years and it was successful and I enjoyed it until I didn't. And that was a moment of kind of an identity crisis. I wasn't even 30 yet. And it was like, oh my goodness, this isn't what I want to do for the rest of my life. What's next? And what I can see now is that I answered that question of what's next, not from a place of like, let's figure out what the title is. It was like, what do I want my life to look like? And what kind of job might fit that? So that was the biggest moment of reinvention for me. And I did explore quite a few different paths, like really random stuff. And eventually I landed on coaching because it fit my skill sets. It fit the lifestyle I wanted to have. It created new possibilities and opportunities for me. And so that was really the big moment of reinvention for me because it took a lot to go from a food writer to a coach. Like that was a very 
big transition, took some training, took some um, identity shifting. And, and that I think was the big moment for me and learning mm. to call myself that instead of what I was before. Right. Like the titles are so important for people, yeah. you know, like what I, I have clients that come to me all the time that say, I used to call myself a lawyer. And now how mm -hmm. do I not say that word <laughs> on, yeah. at a dinner party when that's been my identity for so long? And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a prestige with saying a title or being very in that comfort zone of that. That's who I was, you know, and shifting uh, that, that role can be quite a, a moment of an identity crisis at times. Right. Um, and yeah, that's kind of sounded like you, you took some time to really think about what's going to serve you and where you're evolving into right as a human in order to say yes to coaching and that being the thing for you yeah and I think that title piece is so important right especially if the title that you wore before was something that people immediately got or that got you a lot of attention and prestige you know like food writer might not be the most like prestigious job but it's pretty sexy like people got really right. excited when I talk lots about it. it it immediately instigated conversations when I'm like I'm a coach people were like what do you mean? Like it was very confusing for people. And so you were kind of shutting off that whole channel of communication with people and connection with people. So it was really interesting. And what I really found the longer that I've been in business is it's far less important now to me what the title is than how I help people, what I do. And that's what mm. I like to talk with people about. So I've almost stopped answering the question of like, what's your job title and started talking more about what you do. And I think that that can be really freeing for people too, if they're getting hung up on that. Yes, I love that. And we just can't even encompass everything who we are in one word <laughs> anyway, right? We have to actually have this conversation. Um, well, give us a, a little quick trip down a memory lane to, to kind of tell us how you started your coaching business and mm -hmm. what did you do along the way to design this business in a way that, you know, feels more like you instead of this cookie cutter blueprint that you swipe from the internet or follow another coach out there that might be inspiring you at the moment? Well, I'll say quite honestly, I didn't do that at first, you know, so I started the coaching practice and I will say in my first business, like I very much was doing my own thing. I was carving out my own path, doing things differently than other people. And, and that just felt right to me. I didn't really think about it. I just kind of was like, this is the next step and the next step and the next step. When I got into coaching because it was new and I didn't have, you know, as much training or experience in that field, it was very easy for me to be like, this mentor says, this is how I should set up my services, or this mentor says, this is how I should be doing my marketing. This mentor says I should be buying advertising, like, and to jump in and do those things. And I made a lot of decisions that, that weren't right for me or that I wasn't ready for. I think that was the thing that happened a lot more was mentors who were five years in were telling me to do the same things they were doing then. And I wasn't ready for those. Like I wasn't ready to do a big branding package. I wasn't ready to start running ads. I didn't know enough about my message and my audience and what the work that I did to be in that position yet, but I did do it. And so that ended up being a lot of like mini failures, right? <laughs> Challenges yeah. because I was doing things that just weren't the right strategies for me. Mm. And then at some point, I think the biggest thing for me was, um, the coaching school that I went to really advocated fill your one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, roster. And then as soon as you do that, go to groups. And as soon as you do that, do a membership. And I tried that path, you know, got some one-on-one -on -one clients, didn't fill it, but then was like, I'm going to do groups because my audience is asking for that. And started to see like, I'm not really lit up by this. Like this isn't mm. as exciting to me. What I really like is the one-on-one. -on -one. And that was probably the first time where I was like, here's the growth path laid out in front of me. And I'm actually not going to follow it. I'm going to choose something that's maybe not radically different, but very aligned for me and what I want to do. And I'm just going to see how this goes for me. And that's really where I started questioning is the strategy that someone else is peddling or suggesting, is it right for me? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, but at least yeah. now I ask that question. Yeah, I, I definitely had a very similar experience because in the coaching world, there is this, there is a model, right? Like mm -hmm. you look at the bigger, biggest coaches out there and you just have to see a forecast of what is, you know, what you think is meant for you down the future. You write books, you do the talks, right? You do, you go from one-on-one -on -one to group, then to membership, to subscription and some passive income dream <laughs> in the future, right? And what I did as well was I did so much work in um, trying to scale in the sense where I no longer am involved. And I remember this year very clearly because it was kind of in my third year of business when I first started doing um, a very passive program that had lo a lot of recorded Lydia, but not a lot of live Lydia. And what I found out was even though it worked, one of the interesting things is that I ended up falling out of love with my business because I was no longer in the vicinity of the problems that I love solving. And what got me up at night, which were my clients, you know, were one-on-one -on -one people that I could do deep work with. And that was 
just the qualities that I loved in my business. And, it, and again, it wasn't sexy to say, I'm a, I do one-on-one as a primary offer rather than this big school or a big program that, you know, like a Marie Forleo style that everybody loves. And, and that was a huge awakening for me to kind of get grounded again and go, you know what, we got to do what um, right, works for, for us, even if it doesn't match that blueprint out there either. And even if it's not as leveraged, right? Like I would yes. rather have a smaller business that I'm completely in love with and that feels really fulfilling and impactful to me than a business that's making me tons of money and is really big, but I'm completely disconnected from it. And exactly. Removed. Some people really like, some people are going for that. And I think if that's their style and that's aligned for them, that's what they should be doing. But if you're like, I miss the one-on-one and the impact of the deep work so much that when I remove that, I don't like my business anymore, then you definitely should you know, choose What's a different What's the point? Path. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. So you just recently launched a podcast called Better Than Big, which I've been waiting for and rooting for you. Um, I love hearing your voice, by the way. It's so soothing. I feel like your voice was meant to be like in a meditation track somehow. (laughs) That's what you want to wake up to. Um, And this was sort of, um, you know, many years in the making, I assume, right, of all the Mm -hmm. things that you've learned to build a better than big business, your clients experiences, you know, you have guests, guests that come on your show, right, to share their Mm -hmm. experience about uh, building a better than big business. But for people who may not understand what that really means, like what is better than big? So, So how do you define a business that is better than big? Well, it's hard because it's highly individualized, right? But what sure. I, what happened for me was I started to notice that almost all of my clients or prospective clients were getting on consult calls and they were saying, hey, I don't want the million dollar business. I want something that allows me to live the life that I want, that is highly profitable, that is sustainable, that is a minute for the long haul kind of business. And person after person just kept showing up and saying the same thing. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. One, that they're coming to me and that's what they want because that's what I have and I know how to get them there. And also that there exists this kind of um, group of business owners, this demographic that, like you said, doesn't want this big business that has tons of infrastructure and big team and big revenue and everything. They're not really interested in that for whatever reason. And so that's where the idea of better than big started. Now the, the concept of like, what is better than big? Like initially I was just calling it, it's a simplified, it's a streamlined business, you know? And I had the the joy of working with a mentor who was like, it sounds like what you're talking about is something that's better than big. And I was like, Oh my goodness, bingo. <laughs> like, yeah, I was like, thank you. I love it when that happens. Pull that. So that was really helpful. So for me, like it's, it's simple, it's sustainable, it's streamlined, it's life giving. And, and really the, the biggest thing is that the business becomes the vehicle for the life that you want to live. That's mm-hmm. not always sexy, right? Like right now, my business is the vehicle that allows me to homeschool my kids during the pandemic and like yeah. do thing, do home improvements so our house is nicer for us. Like it allows me to do those things. That's not super sexy. That's not like laptop on the beach kind of thing that we see elsewhere, but it is my business creating the life that I want. And that's, I think the biggest thing when you think about a business that's better than big is, is my business being the vehicle that creates the life that I want? And if yes, then you're totally there. And if not, then make some shifts and you can get there. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing about the, because I live in Bali, so I see the laptop lifestyle influencers that are constantly taking selfies at the beach about themselves. And I'll tell you, right right after they take that selfie, their laptop is burning up. Nobody works on the beach. It's way too hot. It's not good for your laptop. And they are hustling away in a co-working space, working lots of time. Really, you know, that's why sometimes social media can be such an insidious thing too, you know, where we compare ourselves to what we think is the lifestyle and not really seeing what actually happens behind the scenes, right? And I'm really glad your podcast kind of kind of opens up the hood, you know, and be very transparent about how people make decisions, which I think is the much uh, more meaningful thing to talk about rather than the success stories, you know, and where where the end of the rainbow is. Um, now, as, as new business owners or existing business owners that are listening, you know, to this video, uh, Uh, video interview right now, what do you think are the essential questions that we should be asking ourselves to really ensure that we're building that intentional business that you're talking about, right? That business that serves the life we want. What what, What should we be asking to get started in being more familiar or, you know, more in touch with what, what it is that looks like for us? Yeah. So I think a lot of people start with like, what's the business model or what are the services? I like to just take the step back and say, what do I want my business to make possible in my life? 
And that's really where I was at when I was like pivoting into coaching. I had two very young kids at home at the time. Um, I think my daughters were like three and one. And I was like, I want to be present. I want to be able to grow my business as they grow. You know, I'll work more as they get into school age. But I was very intentional about like, I want this to be a business I could run in like 15 hours a week. I didn't know what the business was yet. I was like, I want this business to be impactful. Like that was super important to me. I want to be able to take care of my health and get out for runs and spend time reading and make good meals. And I want all those things to be part of my life. And so I thought about those things first. And then I looked, okay, what kind of hours would I be working? What kind of business would fit within those? Like, what would that look like? And then I started looking at, okay, what are my strengths, my skill sets? But first I got really clear on that possibility. Like what's it going to do for my life? And then from there, that helps you make some choices, right? Like where you can see that's not going to work for me because it's going to make me do X, Y, or Z. And that's not part of my lifestyle plan. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it is something that people skip all the time. I think, you know, they go straight to what should I offer and how much should that be? And how should I package myself, right? As a service provider, but you're right. Like I, I certainly didn't have that. Think about that question. You know, my, my biggest, um, you know, milestone I was trying to meet was just earning an income that replaces my corporate job you know, um, and didn't think a lot about what, what made me quit my job, which was the overworking, right, doing, putting on eight different hats at the same time. And in so many ways, I, I sort of brought that mindset to entrepreneurship. It was almost like I made myself a cubicle job in the first year of business without realizing it until, right, shit hit the fan. And then I went, oh, shit, I have to do something different, you know? Yeah. And that's the norm. That's actually where most of my clients come to me. They're like, oh yeah. my goodness, my I'm fully booked and I'm overwhelmed and I need help like mm. two months ago. And then we're kind of working backwards. I think where your audience is, you know, where they're looking at the business now and they're starting to think about it, like if they can design it that way from the start and have those intentions and those constraints even in place, that can be really helpful. It's not necessarily wrong to like go out, build a business, have tons of success. That's great, right? But it's nice if you don't have to course correct along the way and you can just say like the whole time you're experiencing that success you're also enjoying the life that you want. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, a lot of people, when they first start, uh, you know, a service-based business, they're, they're, looking, they're looking externally, right? They look at the coaches they've worked with, they look at courses they've bought, and a lot of times they try to mirror something, right? They mirror, oh, I really love how that coach has, you know, done their course. I, I should do courses. You know, courses look great, and, you know, I can just design it once and sell it, and all will be well. Now, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about in terms of like how we want to offer a service? Like, does it depend on personality type? Does it depend on their strengths? Like how, how would you kind of go about helping a client of yours figure out the type of service or the model of the way to deliver that service so that it feels like ease? Yeah. So I think two things, one is like, how do you like to work? You know, are you the kind of person who would, who loves relationships, right? And is like, I would love to work with people for two, three years, like go deep, be their coach all the time or, you know, whatever you're going to, they're on demand copywriter, they're on demand designer. Then you know that you're going to offer more of like a retainer model. If you're like, I like kind of the quick and dirty, I come in, I do the job and then I'm done and the project is over. Then you probably are going to look more like a productized services or VIP days or intensives. And I think mm. we forget to ask that question. We, a lot of people just kind of jump to the retainer model. And if you're someone who likes that really quick turnaround and the clear end date and the project is done and it's wrapped, that's not going to work for you. So that's the piece that I think is really important to look at is kind of the service model, how you like to work. And then also, how do you like to work with people? Like if you're someone who likes to work one-on-one, -on -one, like we were talking about, you get a lot of impact out of that. You get a lot of fulfillment out of it. Then you should look at one-on-one. -on -one. If you're someone who's incredible facilitator and group leader or great at leading workshops, you should be looking at those things, even if maybe your peers are saying, don't do that from the, like right out of the gate, mm. that's probably going to be better for you right out of the gate. If that's your skill set and that's the way you like to work. So I think you want to look at both of those things. How do you like to work and how do you like to work with people? Yeah. And in a lot of ways, sometimes you don't know till you try it on for size, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember constantly fantasizing about, you know, courses and teaching. And it wasn't until I did a course that was passive and realized that, right, like I, I wanted to be somewhat involved, maybe not one on one all the time, but, you know, I want to be involved in some way. So these days I have a bit more of a hybrid. So even when I do one on one uh, with my clients is, you know, there's a framework, a, a sort of evergreen course that everyone goes through, but is offered in different ways, whether it's in group or in one on one, but everyone goes through the same framework. And that feels simplified. You know, my IP is in mm -hmm. that evergreen 
piece and I get to deliver more Lydia or less Lydia, depending on which, which service that you take, right? Which feels really, really good for me. Um, but, you know, with a lot of people that are kind of starting a business for the first time, and I know that you're, you're a big believer in right, scaling simply, right? Mm-hmm. And, and kind of growing without the overwhelm. And for new business owners, it's really tempting, right? To buy into that kind of glitzy message that people see out there with things like funnels, you know, Facebook ads, like these automated ways of growing a business that, that feels like, yeah, I, I get how that works and it does work to some degree. But I'm also thinking back about when I first started as a coach, what landed the deals, what got me my first clients, what made my roster, as you said, full, right? In the beginning of time was never about these automated things. It was always through selling through conversation, It was always through participation in Facebook groups and showing up and helping generously. Again, not sexy, automated, funnel-proof methods. So what are your thoughts about, you know, new coaches, new service providers? Like, how do they scale the simple things like these conversations, like not relying on complicated technology because some people just aren't techie and never will be like, how would you imagine scaling as a first time business, whether it's your time or your efforts that can make the, um, the inaugural goal of gaining more clients, filling that roster more easy. I think you hit the nail on the head with the connection piece. I'm going to tell about two of my clients. So both of them fairly new in business. One realized that she was really good at in-person relationships. And so we sent her to a conference. This was pre-COVID. She went, booked herself at a conference, went to the conference, prioritized meeting people over attending all the events that were happening, you know, like just one-on-one connections there. Got a lot of information from people, came back, followed up with them. She was booked out for the next three months. She's an email marketing strategist. Like she talked a little bit about what she did with them while she was there, right? And then followed up. Super simple strategy. Again, books all for three months. I have another client who does case studies for business owners and also web copy. Mm. And we were like, what if you just got on some coffee chats? Like, she's like, I'm really good in person. I'm really good at, you know, chatting with people, talking about what I do. And people usually want to buy from me then. So I was like, let's not worry about social media marketing right out of the gate. Let's not worry about setting up your email newsletter, or anything like that. We'll get to all that stuff for her. But she did a couple of coffee chats and very quickly had her first couple of clients because the moment she started talking about what she did and could talk about the results that she ever people were like, I've never heard of something like this and I want to hire you or I know someone needs to hire you and they sent a referral her way. So I think that that can be really permission giving for people to not overcomplicate yeah. it, like, just look at like what's right in front of them. And I think the same is true for me and my business. Even now, like a lot of my clients come from connection and collaboration, which is just another form of connection. So it, it works and it's simple and it's fun. And so I, I tend to prioritize those things over super techie funnels and, and just like really overwhelming things. I just stick with the simple and it works. Yeah, I feel like we have more control as well. Like you have mm-hmm. more autonomy of where this conversation goes, you know, rather than having a thousand people come through my email list from a Facebook ad, which by the way, I have tried and that worked, but none of those thousand people were really aligned clients. And when I really thought about what it took to fill my coaching practice, I didn't need a thousand clients. <laughs> I need yeah. a, you know, like a handful of really good clients that value my time, were in the perfect place to hire me, you know, and that was really it. And in order to qualify those people, I had to actually talk to them, <laughs> you know, oh my God, talk to people, right? That That's such a, um, a thing that, that feels so, so intimate i think that people especially with coaching i think people need to trust you they don't they can't really just look at an automated email and say yep you're my girl and here's five thousand dollars to work with you right they need to kind of have that conversation i think with us um what what do you think what what's the one shift that you've made in your business that's kind of made all the difference for you and i know there must have been multiple (laughs) things you've you've done but if you can kind of just think about like one shift that's happened for you recently or something that's kind of really made the difference in how you do business, like how did that shift pan out for you mentally and, and how did you then implement that in your business? I think the biggest shift for me as somebody who will probably always be like a recovering perfectionist and, and who likes to like do like high achiever likes to do lots of things is this shift of asking myself, what would this look like if I let this be simple and easy? Mm. So when I ask myself that question, I'm often able to get back to basics 
and it helps you stay in your lane. It helps you stop listening to what everyone else is saying and really just be clear on what you need to do. It also helps me ship things faster, meaning like with my podcast that I launched, let's see, we launched about a month ago and it allowed me to get that out the door. I think if I had stayed in, let's make this the best, most highly produced podcast ever with all the bells and whistles, we probably would be in 2021 and I still wouldn't have launched it. But yeah. when I said, what would this look like if I let this be simple and easy? I'm like, I want my, com- my podcast to be about conversations. I know who to have on. I know how to interview because I have a journalist background. Like that's all I have to do. And of course, we're going to have some good recording. We're going to have you know, some nice elements to it but it doesn't need to have all kinds of bells and whistles for it to be useful. And I'm so glad that I did because, you know, three or four weeks in, I've already gotten a few clients out of that podcast Amazing. and it's resonating. And so like, I think that's the biggest shift for me. And it, it is something I constantly have to ask myself and, and probably will continue to <laughs> forever, but it allows me to have so much ease in my business that doesn't exist if I forget to ask that question. Oh, I'm so glad you shared that because so many people and myself included sometimes as a recovering type A perfectionist, we do sometimes think that we're, we don't have that permission to put something out there and, and be imperfect in our actions because we are, again, comparing ourselves to some of these blockbuster podcasts or big brands that have a team of 10 to do stuff for them, you know, but I think ultimately if the work and the sharing is meaningful and it's helpful and that's, that's at the end of the day, helpful to people is good enough to share, mm-hmm. you know, and you'll yeah. always improve and get better at it. Mm-hmm. And also recognizing like, what's the purpose of this thing? Like totally the my podcast was not even to get clients. It was to share, um, to share ideas and to highlight people who are running very different kinds of businesses. I'm like, I don't need something super fancy to do that. And so that that changed the the game there too like to mm. really think about the purpose and i think that can be true with anything new that you're doing in your business is to really think what's the intention and purpose here and maybe it doesn't need to be so big totally ashley you are such a breath of fresh air in the business industry and i really really love this conversation i think that there we could be talking for 2 hours about this and so i want people to be able to come to you and actually find out more about the work you do. Definitely listen in on the podcast. I'm already on the next podcast episode now. Really easy to listen. I do, you're, you're in my mornings right now, Ashley, <laughs> while I make my coffee. Um, where can people find out more about how to listen to the episodes, find out more about what you do, and just be a part of your world if um, you know this, this video really resonated with them? Yeah. So, I mean, the simplest thing to do is just go to my website, ashleygartland.com. If you want to go straight to the podcast page, it's just backslash podcast and it'll drop you to the podcast page with all the details there about how to listen to it on your favorite player. And I would love for people to listen in and not just to hear my story, but to hear the stories of these business owners that are coming on because there's such fascinating conversations. Like we just did one with somebody about how she's quitting social media and another one with someone who's doing only VIP days and how they're designing that. So like there's just so much so many untapped stories and I'm so excited to be telling them on that platform. Yeah. I can't wait to listen to that one. The social media thing is huge. I just finished watching that documentary on Netflix, the social dilemma. Oh my goodness. Mm. It really makes you question how much your chemistry in your brain is changing and that you're not making decisions on your own. You're being told what to, how to make decisions. And that's, you know, something that if, if when I think about uh, what causes me most angst, in my business is when I have to fill up the social media tank, you know, Mm -hmm. and that takes me away from the work I'm actually getting paid for because I'm not a social media manager. I'm a coach and I should be coaching more rather than thinking up of, you know, great images to put on my social media. Yeah. You'll (laughs) like the episode then. It, It definitely got me thinking. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ashley, for joining us. And for all of you watching, I will be putting uh, the show notes and all the links to Ashley's podcast, website, and social media links to say hello to her and thank her for coming here. And if you know anyone that would be um, loving this episode and loving to watch this, please send this to them and share the love. Thanks, Ashley, for being here. Thank you.